If you're watching on the internet, good morning. Welcome to Open Door Bible Church, West Gossip, New Hampshire. Today we are in 1 Thessalonians, chapter 5. I'll start with the first three verses. Now remember, he had just in the last chapter talked about Jesus coming again. But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. But when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction shall come upon them, as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But let's look at it verse by verse. Concerning the times and seasons, you have no need that I should write to you. The Thessalonian church have been well taught about the return of Jesus and other prophetic matters. Paul taught them about the time and the seasons regarding the return of Jesus. They had a good idea of the prophetic times they lived in, and they could discern the seasons of the present culture. Verse 2, For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. The Thessalonians knew and had been taught that they couldn't know the exact date of Jesus' return. That day will remain unknown and will come as a surprise. He says it's going to be as a thief in the night. Some take the idea that the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night to mean that nothing can or should be known about God's prophetic plan for the future. Yet Paul indicated that they definitely knew that, I want you to get this, they definitely knew that the time could not be definitely known. Let me do that again. So that they definitely knew that the time couldn't be definitely known. So, one of my tips to you if you watch religious programs on late night television, when the guy tells you he knows when Jesus is coming back, he's lying, change the channel. Nobody knows when Jesus is coming back. All right, now, talks about the day of the Lord. The day, now, you have to get Bible terminology straight. The day of the Lord is not a single 24-hour day. It is a season. It is a period of time. So don't, it's not on Friday Jesus is coming back. It's a season of time. It's a period. There's a number of things have to happen. So with this phrase, the day of the Lord, Paul quoted a familiar Old Testament idea. The idea behind the phrase, the day of the Lord, means that it is God's time. Man has had his day, now God is going to have his time. In the ultimate sense, the day of the Lord is fulfilled with Jesus judging the earth and returning in glory. And we all want that to happen. Again, as I told you, it does not refer to a single day, but to a season. Now this season is when the Lord will rapidly advance his agenda to the end of the age. I'm kind of waiting for that to happen. The day of the Lord is a familiar Old Testament expression. It denotes the day when God intervenes in history to judge his enemies, deliver his people, and establish his kingdom. That all sounds good. I like that. Verse 3. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them. The unexpected nature of that day will be a tragedy for the unbeliever. They will be lulled to sleep by political and economic conditions, but they will be rudely awakened and will hear the frightening verdict that they cannot escape. This sudden coming in a time when many say peace and safety must be distinct from the coming of Jesus described in Matthew chapter 24 coming of Jesus described in Matthew chapter 24 happens at a time of great global catastrophe when no one could possibly say peace and safety. Comparing these two passages shows that there must in some way be two aspects to Jesus' second coming. One aspect of his coming is an unexpected hour. The other is positively predicted. One coming is to a business as usual world kind of like this morning, and the other to a world in cataclysm. One coming is to meet Jesus in the air, the other is his coming with his saints, 
That's us. One is the rapture. One is Armageddon. So Jesus coming back is a two-part situation. In the first part, the rapture, Jesus meets us in the air. He never touches foot on planet Earth. The second time he's coming to planet Earth, we're coming with him. Jesus is riding a horse. We're riding horses. We're part of the army that's going to defeat the enemy. Now, we're not going to have to do any heavy lifting. Jesus is going to do all the work. But we're going to be there with him. All right, verses 4 and 5. The basis for Paul exhorting these people. But you, brethren, the guys in the church, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should not overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. So we're supposed to be about light. We're supposed to be all day. We're not supposed to be about darkness. In addressing their behavior, Paul first simply told the Thessalonian Christians that they should be who they are. God had made us sons of light and sons of the day. Now, we weren't sons of light automatically. We weren't sons of light when we were first born because we were born with that inherited sin nature of Adam. But when we got saved, when we asked Jesus into our heart, we became sons of light. He says that this day should not overtake you as a thief. Paul means that this should not happen for the believers. We shouldn't be surprised. We should be living expectantly. You know, you think you hear a noise, there's a trumpet, you ought to be looking up just to make sure. It could happen any day. There is nothing that has to be fulfilled to keep Jesus from coming back. Now, that's not always been true. I mean, for years and years and years, people preached Jesus coming back. But there were conditions that weren't fulfilled. The last of those conditions to be fulfilled was Israel being back in the land. Israel's there. Jesus can come at any time. The rapture could happen before I finish the message this morning. Uh, in that case, I won't be here to finish the message. My hope is you will not be here to notice I'm not here. Because we all ought to be going up in the air to meet Jesus. Now, in some aspects, Jesus will be a surprise to everybody. Because nobody knows the exact time. But we should live like it could be today. We ought to behave like it could be today. We ought to not leave undone things we would do if we knew Jesus was coming back today. It ought to make us stay in the moment. It ought to make us take care of business. All right, he goes on, continues to exhort them in verses 6 through 8. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do. But let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk, are drunk at night. But let us who are of the day, be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. So, verse 6. Therefore let us not sleep. Because we do not belong to the night or to the darkness, our spiritual condition should never be marked by sleep. So we isn't talking about that you can't sleep at night. He's talking about the fact that spiritually, we ought to be awake. We ought to be tuned into what's happening. We need to be active and aware. We need to be watching and be sober. Now, sober doesn't mean not drunk. It has a mind knowing the proper value of things to understand what's important and what isn't important. The world has a very messed up idea of what's important. It thinks stuff is important. It thinks fame is important. It thinks popularity is important. God doesn't rate us based on any of those things. God wants us to be faithful. God wants us to be holy. God wants us to be serving him. That's what we're supposed to be doing. We ought to be living like we're in the light and not in the darkness. For those who sleep, sleep at night, verse 7. And those who get drunk, are drunk at night. So the opposite of spiritual watchfulness is spiritual sleep. The opposite of spiritual sobriety 
is to be spiritually drunk. As Christians, we are of the day, and so we must watch and be sober. We need to be making right decisions. We need to be living rightly. We need to be an example for those around us. Now, verse 8, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. Sounds a lot like the armor of God in Ephesians, doesn't it? Yeah. All right. Paul used the images of a soldier's armor to illustrate the idea of watchfulness. A soldier is a good example of someone who must watch and be sober and be awake. You know what the penalty was for falling asleep on guard duty? They shot you. You didn't get a second chance. That was a capital offense. If you were supposed to be guarding the base and you fell asleep on guard duty, you are out of there. So we need to be like that. We need to be awake spiritually. We need to be paying attention. When one compares the description of spiritual armor found in Ephesians 6, while we talk about every Sunday in the slides, there is not an exact correlation with this chapter. This indicates that Paul saw the idea of spiritual armor as a helpful picture not as a rigid checklist. Now, I don't want you to get up in the morning and say, where's my checklist? i got to stand in front of the mirror, make sure I get these things passing in this order. It's a picture. It's a guide. It means pay attention. Be aware. Make sure we're doing the things God wants us to do. Now, verses 9 and 10, he's going to talk about the security of our future. It is important to God that we have complete confidence in what's going to happen to us and where we're going to go when we die. There should be no doubt in the Christian's mind about this. It should be something that's settled. So verse 9, For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. So, he starts off, for God did not appoint to us. He's talking to the church. He's talking to Christians. He's talking to born-again people. This does not apply to people who are lost. This does not apply to people who don't know Jesus. This is for the Christians. We're not appointed to wrath. I don't have to be punished for my sins. Jesus already took that punishment. It's done. It's paid for. I don't have to pay it. There was no way in this world I could have worked enough to pay that bill. I would have had to die, go to hell, and suffer for all eternity. Jesus made it possible for me to escape that by paying the price for me. If I accept that Christ, that price, we call that being born again, we call that being saved. If we allow Jesus to pay that price for us, then we don't have to pay it. We don't have to worry about it. We are not under the wrath of God. By the way, we'll talk later about do Christians go through the tribulation. No, the tribulation is part of the punishment. I don't have to be punished. My sins are paid for. I don't have any punishment coming. All I've got is eternal reward coming because of what Jesus did. Right. Verse 10, who died for us, the idea that Jesus died in our place. Not simply that Jesus died for us in the sense of doing us a favor, but that he died as a substitute in exchange for us. Whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Now, wake or sleep means whether I'm alive, whether my body has died and I've gone to be with Jesus, in any condition, I'm with him. There's no other choice for me to worry about. My destiny is already determined. We always live together with Jesus. The promise of unity with Jesus can't be broken. Whether we live or die, if we've been born again, we will always be with Jesus forever. Amen. Forever is a good thing, mm -hmm. like forever. This is the kind of faith that we want to display. This is how we want to live. There's lots of things I may be concerned about. I don't need to be concerned about where I'm going to spend my future. In fact, God thought it was so important 
towards the end of the Bible, he put a message in. The message is in 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. These things have I written unto you, that Christians, that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. Not that you got to hope for it, not that you got to earn it, not that you got to do something about it. All you have to do is acknowledge, I've got it. It was a free gift. Jesus gave it to me. No matter how bad the devil wants to take it away from me, he can't. I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. There's nothing the devil can do to stop me. Now, since the devil knows he can't stop me from going to heaven, and yes, he understands that, he's going to settle for second best. Second best is making sure I don't take anybody with me. So, every time you try to reach somebody, he's going to throw some kind of a roadblock in your way. Just keep working at it. Just keep telling people. Don't let the devil discourage you or stop you. All right. Verse 11. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another just as you are also doing. So Paul again tells us not to take comfort, but to give comfort. And get this, if all Christians had a heart to comfort each other, everybody would be comforted. There's lots of Christians who aren't comforted because nobody's doing their job. No, there are Christians who sleep at the wheel. Uh, I see them in traffic sometimes. <laughs> all right. So we're supposed to edify. Edify is a fancy word for building people up, for encouraging them. Now, the early church understood, and this is what Paul's teaching the early church, that the care of people's souls was not delegated just to pastors. It isn't my job and Terry's job. It's all our jobs to take care of people, especially the people in the church. Now, he says to them, just as you're also doing. So they, they've got some of this. They're doing some of it. He just wants to make sure they keep on doing it and they expand. All right, in verses 12 and 13, Paul's going to urge them to do three things, all in regards to their leaders. Now, I would just leave this out and not talk about this because you, you're going to think I'm trying to do something for me and Terry. I'm just going to teach you the Bible. And we urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Be at peace among yourselves. That's a happy church. A church that's at peace among itself. A church that isn't squabbling and fighting and complaining and arguing. Where at the church business meeting you have to have a referee to keep people under control. That's not how it's supposed to function. It's supposed to be a loving place. So verse 12. Recognize those who labor among you. Christians are to recognize their leaders, and leaders are described in three ways. Leaders are recognized not by their title, but by their service. A title is fine, but it's only if the title is true, and if the title describes what the person really does before God and man. It says, and over you in the Lord. Leaders are recognized as being over the congregation in the sense of ruling and providing headship, as a shepherd is over the sheep. This describes a clear and legitimate order of authority. But pastor, you hurt my feelings. I'm sorry. By the way, if I haven't hurt your feelings yet, be patient. I will. It's just how it works. But it's not that I don't love you. I do. I wouldn't do this job if I didn't love you. Pastor Terry wouldn't do this job if he didn't love you. We do this because we love you. And it says, and they admonish you. Leaders are recognized as those who admonish the congregation. To admonish means to caution or to reprove gently. To warn. To say, hey, watch what you're doing. You sure you're going in the right direction? You sure this is something God wants you to do? Now, I, I love this. I get this out of my commentary. This is cute sounding. I take no credit for it. It says, the tone of Paul's instructions is brotherly, but it's big brotherly. It's a big brother talking to a little brother. 
saying, hey kid, here's what you're going to do to survive in the world. So, that's what leadership ought to be doing. Now, is everybody going to like it when leadership does that? Not necessarily. Love them anyhow. Esteem them very highly in love. Christians are to esteem their leaders and to esteem them very highly in love. They should do this for their work's sake. Leaders don't deserve esteem because of their title or because of their personality, but because of their labor on behalf of God's people. Be at peace among yourselves. Paul's saying the church ought to be a quiet, happy place. It ought to be a place you can come to and be comfortable. It ought to be a place you can come to and enjoy yourself. It ought to be a place you can come to where people will encourage you and uplift you and support you. That's what it's supposed to be. Now, what keeps that from happening is people get offended. And like I say, if I haven't offended you, give me time. I will. Uh, but in my favorite verse, Psalms 119, verse 165, Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Please don't call me up and tell me somebody who offended you. Because I'm going to suggest perhaps you don't love the law like you ought to. Because that's what the Bible says. People are people. People are going to aggravate you. People are going to annoy you. Family aggravates you. Family annoys you. Don't they, Kaylee? You just love them in spite of it, right? You just keep on loving. That's what you do. I'm going to offend you some days. I'm sorry. Didn't mean to do it. Just keep loving me. I'll keep teaching the word. You keep loving me and overlook my flaws. And I'll overlook yours. And we'll just keep going together. All right. Now, verses 14 and 15, the Apostle Paul gets really practical sometimes. See, he's going to exhort them on how to deal with difficult people. How many of you have somebody difficult in your life? Raise your hands. Okay, every hand is up. All right. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly, unruly comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak, be patient with all. Let me do that last part again. <laughs> be patient with all. A patient church is a happy church. Okay? I don't want there to be stress here. I don't want there to be folks arguing with each other. I don't want you coming and telling me, you don't know what brother so-and-so did to me. You don't know what sister so-and-so said about me. I don't care. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. He suppose that's God saying, hey dummies, don't be offended. I think that's what God's saying. Don't be offended. Doesn't accomplish anything. So, verse 14. Now we exhort you. To exhort is to tell someone, someone what they must do. Now, you do it without being mean. You try to not be critical. It's not a condemnation. But it's information they can use. It's how they can fix the problem. Every now and then we need to say to somebody, hey, about this situation, are you doing what the Bible teaches? We all need that sometimes. Uh, you will normally find me doing that when I find people who are upset at each other and refuse to forgive and get along. Because uh, I know that destroys the church. So we try to keep everybody happy. Uh, Paul told the Thessalonians, that not only the pastors and leaders, but the whole church was responsible for the unity of the church. They needed to comfort one another. They needed to take care of one another. They needed to speak up when it was necessary to speak up. Now he talks about the unruly, those who are out of order. It's a military term. It describes a soldier who's out of step with the rest of the soldiers he's marching with. I've had people in church out of step. We need to get back in step. We need to be going in the same direction. Talks about faint-hearted. 
the translation of that word is literally to have a small soul. They are people with small souls. By nature or experience, they tend to be timid and they lack courage. These folks need to be comforted. The idea of comfort is to assist them by lending them your strength. They come alongside them and say, let me help you with this. Let me pray about this with you. Let me offer some advice. Yeah, again, not in a pushy way, but in a, I'm concerned about your way. Talks about those who are weak. Must be upheld and assisted with an eye to building their own strength instead of perpetuating their weakness. Whenever you help somebody, the goal is to help them so that next time they can handle this on their own. It's the difference between buying a guy a fish sandwich at McDonald's and taking the guy out and teaching him how to catch fish. You know, you want him to be able to survive on his own. That's what we want people to do, to be able to stand on their own, to be self-sufficient. And then he kind of lumps it all up by saying, be patient with all. Though different approaches must be taken with different people, Christians must be patient with all. This is because true Christianity is shown by the ability to love and help and minister to difficult people. It's easy for me to minister to the person who's doing everything they're supposed to, and every time I ask them to do something, they do it. It's easy for me to work with those people. The person who constantly wants to argue with me and tell me there's a better way, and why am I so pig at it? That's the person I have trouble with. But i got to love them anyhow. i got to be patient with them. Sometimes I go home with swords in my mouth and biting my lip to be patient. Sometimes you need not to say something. It's easier to swallow your words than it is to take them back after they get out of your mouth. Once you've said something, the damage is done. So please have your brains in gear before you start chewing somebody out. All right, verses 16 through 18, he's going to talk with them about their personal worship. It's good instruction to give a church, so we're going to look at this as instructions for our church. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Now rejoice always. Not only rejoicing in the happy things, but in sorrows also. Christians can rejoice always because the joy is not based on circumstances. Circumstances change, God doesn't. You're going to have good days, and you're going to have bad days. Happens to everybody. Everybody has a bad day. Get through it. If you're going to cross somebody, and they're having a bad day, and they dump their bad day all over your shoes, love them anyhow. Don't holler at them. Just say, hey, they're having a bad day. I'll pray for them. Because okay? we all have bad days, don't we, Marsha? Yeah, we Some days you just want to strangle somebody. Okay? Yeah. But don't. Uh, so we're going to rejoice always because God's in control. By the way, whatever just happened to you, God could have stopped it from happening. Because God can do anything, right? So if it happened, at the very least, God allowed it to happen. If God allowed it to happen, there was a purpose in it. I may not see the purpose. I may question, why in the world did you let that happen to me, God? But you know what? God knows what he's doing. He's smarter than I am. And I just need to say, what am I supposed to learn from this God? And I will learn. Pray without ceasing. We're supposed to be praying all the time. Well, how can I do that, Pastor? Prayer is communicating with God. And we can live each minute of the day in a constant flowing conversation with God. Now, I've told you before, if you could see my prayer life, if you could... I can stick a speaker off the side of my head and you could listen to me going through my day praying. You would call somebody to have me locked up in a padded room. But I just have this running conversation with God about what am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to do it? Where am I supposed to do it? When am I supposed to do it? Uh, the hardest thing for me in life is to see something that needs fixing and to restrain myself from fixing it 
until God tells me to fix it. Because I just want to jump in and fix it. Uh, I often make things worse when I do it. So I have to really pray about God, when, how, where do I do things? So, there are many variables that we can get from this command to pray without ceasing. One, I'm going to give you some of the things we can learn from that first. The use of the voice is not an essential element in prayer. We don't have to pray out loud. You can pray in your heart and just talk to God. The posture of prayer is not of primary importance. I, mean, I know folks who get all upset. If you got to kneel when you pray. you got to stand when you pray. you got to lay in your stomach when you pray. That isn't in the Bible when you pray. Now, all of those postures are mentioned, but none of them are mandated. So pray any way that you're comfortable and God tells you to. Where you pray isn't important. You can pray any place. I spend a lot of time praying behind my steering wheel. Especially if I'm behind a Massachusetts driver. <laughs> but you just pray all the time. A particular time of prayer is not important. Pray all the time. And a Christian should never be in a place where they can't pray. If you find yourself someplace and you can't pray there, you ain't supposed to be there. Remove yourself from the premises. Verse 18. In everything give thanks. Now, watch the words. We don't give thanks for everything, but in everything. Again, we recognize God's sovereign hand is in charge. Whatever just happened did not happen because of fate, accidents, occurrences. It happened because God allowed it to happen. God wasn't surprised by it. I don't have to run and probably get to have an emergency prayer meeting because just some, something just terrible happened and you don't know about it. Yes, he does. Knew about it before it happened. Well, I don't like that. Tell God you don't like it. Talk to him. It's okay. It says, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. After each one of these exhortations, rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. And everything to give thanks. We are told to do them because it's the will of God. The thought is that this is God's will, so you must do it. The thought is, this is God's will, so you can do it. It isn't easy to rejoice always. It isn't easy to pray without ceasing. It isn't easy in everything to give thanks. But we can do it because God's going to give us the strength to do it. That's what he's talking about. Not that I enjoy everything that happens to me. That's the stuff that happens to me I don't like at all. But I can still rejoice in it. I lived. I survived. I'm still here. Thank you, Lord. Uh, I don't know how many times I heard thank you, Lord, between Brother Glenn and I as we were changing the pump. Every time something worked, we said, thank you, Lord. Thank you that this piece didn't break. Thank you that this piece fit. Thank you that this was a three-hour job and not a 33-hour job. Because I've had those. So we just be thankful in everything. All right. He's going to exhort them about how to do public worship. So I hope I'm doing all these things right now. Verses 19 through 22. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies. Test all things. Hold fast what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. By the way, there's another place in the Bible where it tells us to abstain from the appearances of evil. Don't even let it look like you're doing evil. All right. So the first one, 19. Do not quench the spirit. We can quench the fire of the spirit by our doubt, our indifference, or our flat-out disobedience. That's when that little voice is telling you you're supposed to do something, and you say, but I don't want to do that, God. And the voice keeps telling you to do that, and you keep saying, but I don't want to do that, God. That's quenching the Spirit. By the way, if you do that often enough, you will no longer hear the Spirit talking to you. Okay? You say no often enough, you lose the ability to hear that voice. Do not despise prophecies. 
We recognize that the Lord speaks to us through people, different people, varied people, strange people. Now, lots of people come to me and say, God wants me to tell you something. Now, I am polite. I listen. I say, Lord, is that a message you have for me? Is there something I'm supposed to do about this? Or is this just somebody who's heard a message from somebody besides God and thought they should deliver it to me? Now, I've received some good advice from people. I've received some advice I absolutely, positively knew was not from the Lord. But in every case, I was polite. And that's the important part. Be polite. Because it just might be God's trying to tell you something. Uh, I have a lady comes to Bible study and she tells me she's had visions and we listen to every one of them. And I'm not going to tell you whether she had a vision or not. Not my job. If it lines up with the Bible, I'm going to listen. But I'm always going to be polite. That's part of what it's getting at. Now, understand when it talks about prophecy here, this isn't somebody coming and telling me, God told me to let you know that your house is going to catch on fire next Friday. It's not telling me stuff that hasn't happened yet. In this context, we're talking about prophecy. It's not predicting future events, but proclaiming those things God has already spoken, both through the prophets in the Old Testament and the apostles in the New Testament. Now, all that stuff that was given in the Old Testament is good wisdom. It was God-given. Does it still work? Yes. Now, am I under the Old Testament rules and regulations? No. Can I learn from the Old Testament prophets? Absolutely. Now, the advantage I have is I know the New Testament. So all those guys we study on Wednesdays, it amazes me at their faithfulness, at their insight, and the fact they didn't know what I know about the future because they didn't have the New Testament but they were still faithful, and whatever God told them, they put down. Now, there were guys who wrote stuff down, they didn't have a clue what it meant. I have a clue today because I've been able to read the New Testament alongside the Old Testament. But those guys didn't, and they were still faithful to it, and there's still wisdom I can get out of it. I get really upset with churches who say, we don't teach the Old Testament anymore. Jesus isn't in there. They need to come to about two of our Bible studies. Wednesday class, do we find Jesus every Wednesday afternoon in the Old Testament? We sure do. He, Jesus' fingerprints are all over the Old Testament. Don't let anybody tell you that Jesus isn't there. All right, verse 21. Test all things. Hold fast what is good. Evil and deception can show itself even in a spiritual setting. So it's important that we test all things. When the test has been made, according to the standards of God's word, we are then to hold fast what is good. Now, between the time Paul last saw this church, when he established it, he was there for a month, he's now been gone for several years, so between the time when he last saw these people and writing this letter, Paul spent time in Berea. He talks about it in Acts chapter 17. He talked about the fact that the Christians in Berea were more noble because when they heard Paul's preaching, they diligently searched the scriptures to see if what Paul said was true. Now, let's stop and think. Church is a good place to think. Here's Paul. He's talking to the Thessalonian church. He's talking to them about the church in Berea. He says, boy, these guys in Berea were more noble than most. And he says, when they heard me preach, they diligently searched the scriptures to see if what was said was true. What scriptures did the Berean church search? Miss Elizabeth. The Old, the Old Testament. They didn't have a New Testament yet. So if they're searching scripture, they're searching Old Testament. Well, that tells me searching the Old Testament is of value. I, again, I get really upset with these churches, and they're around, that don't do the Old Testament. Is it relevant? Gee, I think it's very relevant. All right, let me keep going. Uh, verses 23 and 24. Uh, this is Paul starting to wind down the book. 
Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful who will also do it. All right, so verse 23. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. The idea behind the word sanctify is to set apart, to make something new that is different and distinct, to form a new association. Okay, for example, ladies, a dress is just a dress, unless it's your wedding dress, and it's something different. Uh, a truck is just a truck to some people, a truck to some guys is everything. No, it's all relative. So, he says, we're to be sanctified. We're to be set apart. We're to be living for God. Now, if I'm truly living for God, then I'm going to do those things that pleases God, and I'm going to not do those things that displease God. So, there are some things that the world says is okay, that as Christians, I, I ought not to do. Because they're not good for me. They're not healthy. They're not pleasing to the Lord. Now, I've told you before, I had a pastor whose favorite saying was, others may, I cannot. <coughs> That's a good saying. <coughs> There's things people can do that we ought not to be doing. We ought to understand they were harmful for us. They will damage us. Uh, <coughs> The best example I can give you is a alcoholic, <coughs> picture a guy who's, gee, he's been sober for two years. He's got his two-year coin in his pocket. His buddies want to go out and celebrate something, and they're going to go to the bar, and they say, well, you can come to the bar with us and not drink. We'll just get you a Coke. He can't afford to go to that place. He can't smell the smell. He can't listen to the music. He can't get involved with that crowd. He can't afford to be there. Because he's going to slip right back to where he was before. Now, is going to the bar wrong? No, it's wrong for him. So there's things we can't do. There's places we can't go. There's folks we can't associate with. There's things we can't watch. There's things we can't listen to. If we're going to be sanctified. If we're going to be holy. Oh, gee, Pastor, you don't want me to have any fun. I have more fun than any ten lost people you know. Trust me. You don't get to live in sin to have fun. Christian can have more fun than a non-Christian any day of the week. Right, Pastor Terry? Pastor Terry and I have fun. We don't get to go to the wrong places and do the wrong thing to have fun. All right, so. We're to be sanctified. We're to be holy. It says, now may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved. There's an order that Paul's trying to teach us here. We may receive this order as inspired. God intends there to be a hierarchy within the human person. It begins with our spirit, then our soul, and then our body. That means my spirit, my God consciousness, my God awareness is to control what I do, not my body. I shouldn't be doing things that my body wants to do to make my body feel good. I should be doing those things that please God. And there's going to be a battle sometimes. And my body's going to fight back and say, I want to do this. And I'm going to stop my feet and pout until we do it. i got to say, no, we're not doing that body. That's not what God wants. It's a battle. It never goes away. It never stops, and you need to learn to win the battle. Okay? We're going to have to tell our body no sometimes. God designed the human to live in this order, spirit, soul, and body, not the other way around. The body needs to be subject to the spirit, not the other way. All right, he ends up talking about prayer, verses 25 and 26. Brethren, Pray for us. Greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. So Paul was an apostle. 
And the Thessalonian church was made up of young Christians. Paul still believed he needed their prayers. So he simply says to them, pray for us. God requires that his people should pray for his ministers. And it is not to be wondered what happens when you don't pray. Now, I want you to think about this. Yeah, yeah. Pastor Terry and I all the time ask you to pray for us. Think about it. You come to church and you say, well, you know, the music service this morning wasn't so hot. The message was kind of flat. The whole thing was kind of boring. I wonder, did you pray for Lisa and Linda and the worship team this week? Did you pray for the person who was going to be speaking? What if the success of the service was based solely on how much you prayed for the service this week? Wow. Now, uh, I guess as a pastor, I'm kind of transparent. I kind of tell you how things are. Uh, my wife says to me every morning, how'd you sleep? I never sleep good on Saturday nights. I worry about the church every Saturday night. I worry about the message, whether I'm giving it or somebody else is giving it. I literally agonize over the church. Now, I'm going to be messed up next Saturday night, Miss Elizabeth, because you sat someplace different today. Because <laughs> when I pray for you guys, I just visualize the auditorium and I pray seat by seat, row by row. When you sit someplace else, you screw up my whole prayer life. But we need to be praying for each other. You need to be praying for the church. Uh, truest statement you're ever going to hear anybody say in church, everybody is having a tough time. Some people wear it on their sleeves. Some people could be dying, I wouldn't tell you. But everybody is having a tough time in some area. So we need to love everybody. We need to be encouraging to everybody. You know, I mean, you don't know if this person you've spoken to just got served with eviction papers, just found out they got cancer. You don't know what people are going through. They don't wear it on their faces. Pastor Terry could have his leg amputated and I wouldn't know it. He'd just keep going. But that doesn't mean he isn't hurting. All of us need to be sensitive to each other. There's folks in here hurting this morning. Some of the problems you know, some of them you don't. But everybody needs love. Everybody needs encouragement. Everybody needs, what do we call it, Miss Elizabeth? A God hug? We all need that stuff. We need that encouragement. We need to be bolstered up. So, make sure you're praying for the service. All right, uh, the next verse, greet all the brethren with a holy kiss was written before COVID. <laughs> so please, no kissing in church. Keep your germs to yourself. By the way, in Paul's day, it started off, when Paul first gave this exhortation, men kiss men, women kiss women, <laughs> And all of a sudden, men and women started kissing in the church. And it all fell apart. So, just be nice. We're not going to kiss each other. All right. Verses 27 and 28. Conclusion to the letter. He, he is going to end the letter. I am going to end the message. Honest. Verses 27 and 28. I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read to all the holy brethren. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. So Paul asked that the letter be read to all so that his contents could be heard and known by the whole church. By the way, when the Thessalonian church got done reading the letter, they sent it to the next church. They read it, made a copy of it, sent it to the next church. These letters were all carried from church to church because that's all they had in the beginning. They didn't have the Bible as you know it. They couldn't go to a Bible bookstore and buy a Bible. Old Testament times, it wasn't books. It was great big scrolls. I mean, I'm going to fill the whole foot of this room with the scrolls for the Old Testament. New Testament was little pieces of stuff <coughs> copied out of a letter. We'd copy two or three verses of Paul's letter and hang on to it. Each person would get a little piece. And that was precious to him. So he wanted to make sure the letter made its rounds and everybody get to read it. 
He closed it with the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. All of Paul's letters ended with the idea of grace. If you haven't heard me do it before, grace, G-R-A-C-E, God's riches at Christ's expense. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. It says on the sign behind me, my chains are gone. I shout glory every time I hear that. Because we were bound in sin. We were headed in the wrong direction. Jesus not only saved me, he took the chains off me. He set me free. He paid the price for me. That's, that's good news, folks. That's the gospel. The good news. The Bible tells us that every single one of us is a sinner. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's nobody that was good. If just one person had been good, Jesus could have stayed home. But there wasn't a good person to be found. So God sent his son. He lived 33 and a half years sinless, perfect, kept every law, kept every commandment, didn't break one of them. Only person that ever lived that did that. And because he was sinless, he was qualified to go to the cross and bear my sins and bear your sins. He died in our place. He didn't have to. By the way, God the Father didn't say, Jesus, I got an order for you. God the Father says, I'm looking for a volunteer. Jesus put up his hand and said, ooh, 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 me. Let me go. Let me ransom them. Let me pay for their sin. And he left heaven. Think about heaven. And came to earth. Lived as a man. Misunderstood. Hated. Rejected. Spit on. Beaten. For you and for me. And all I have to do to go to heaven is say, God, I understand I'm a sinner. I'm sorry for my sin. Please save me and come into my heart. And take me to heaven when I die. If you're watching, that's all you have to say. Salvation is that simple. It is too important to miss. It is too important to take chances with. Thank you for joining us at Open Door Bible Church this morning. We're in West Ossipee, New Hampshire. Same parking lot as McDonald's. Come and visit us, 9.30 on Sundays, 2 and 6.30 on Wednesdays. God bless you and have a great day.